I'm Frazier Hagerman, and I'm the Program Manager for the East West Psychology Department. And I am happy to say that East West Psychology and Ecology, Spirituality, and Religion have the Executive Director of the Eco Village Dancing Rabbit in Missouri here today. Her name's Lee Quay Ludwig. <laughs> and because I just met her, just a little while ago, I thought it would be great if a close friend of hers could introduce her in a more warm way. So I would like yeah. to introduce Chong Hee Tan. He's the founder of Bay Bucks. It's a regional currency in the Bay Area, and he's also a board member on Dancing Rabbit Eco Village Board of Directors. So Chong Hee, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, great to see you guys here. So, Mike Way, I've uh, known for a couple of years now, and she's turning into a really great friend. I really, really enjoy knowing her. Now, Mike Way has done a lot of really wonderful things in her life. She, of course, is the executive director of the Dancing Rabbit nonprofit. She's also sit on the board of Fellowship for Intentional Community, which is a global, I think, body of intentional communities around the world. And Mike Wei is also a writer. She wrote this book, Passion as Big as a Planet, Evolving Ecoactivism in America. And I'll leave the book over there later on if you guys are interested. And of course, she, you might also know her as a very well-known TED Talk speaker talking about how it is possible for us to live with much less resources and much smaller footprint than we previously thought possible. And Besides all these great achievements, Mai Kui is also a very warm and loving person, and I'm very happy, to, if I can I share that, that I'm actually responsible for <laughs> introducing her to her current love of her life. <laughs> so, without further ado, let me uh, welcome Mai Kui and give the floor to her. Please give her a warm welcome. Um, so this is not my eco-village. Uh, so what this is are um, some of the images that were handed from a really young age, and this is what success is supposed to look like. And if you were here for the panel talk that happened right before this, one of the presenters was talking about how culture is basically the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And so these are some of the stories that we tell ourselves about what success is supposed to be and what sort of the pinnacle of our culture is supposed to be. And this is heavily materialistic and profoundly unsustainable. And when you put these images together with the images that we also tell ourselves, the stories we also tell ourselves about what a sustainable life might look like, um, they add up to a real serious problem for sustainability because we get stuff like this. So there's the flaky hippie image that we have, like it'd be kind of crazy to even try this thing, like it's a little weird, right? And then there's another set of images that I think are even more damaging. And those are the ones that say that if we try to live on fewer resources, we're basically contending ourselves to a life of deprivation. So I want you to do a little thought experiment with me for a minute, and that's this. I want you to bring to mind, whoops, so you add all that up, it sucks, right? That's what we think is going to happen. Um, so picture your life for a second for me. Uh, so, you know, the spaces you occupy, your routines, your gadgets, how you get around, all that kind of stuff. So just picture your life for a moment. And then I want you to just try to imagine that life lived on 10% of the resources that you're currently using. Does that suck or what? You know, for most people it's really, really hard to picture what that might actually look like. Okay, and this number is really important. So this is the number that the climate scientists are telling us we're going to have to get our carbon emissions down to about 10% of your average American if we're going to get a handle on climate change. And it's also the number that a number of resource use scientists have said, you know, if we did a considerable amount of recycling, we could probably get by in a sustainable way using about 10% of the resources of your average American. And so this is critical. And it's important. So one of the things I want to do tonight is to give you some other images. I want to give you another story of what sustainable living might look like that's probably really different from what you're carrying around right now in your head. 
Um, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about optimism. And we're going to take a little sidetrack here. So I want you to do another little thought experiment with me. And imagine that what's inside this box is the state of the world exactly as it is. Okay, so everything that's happening right now on the earth is in this box. The good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, it's in here. And there's a whole bunch of ways that we can interact with this box. Okay, so we can put both feet inside here. We can look around and basically say, this is the way the world is. This is all that's ever going to be. You don't like it. Yeah, suck it up. Okay, and this is pessimism. Okay, and there's not a lot of ability to change anything when you've got both feet inside this box. Because there's not a lot of hope, there's not a lot of freedom, there's not a lot of creativity. So the opposite of this is putting both feet outside of the box. And this is kind of the like Pollyanna thing, like, oh, it's all good, man. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of crazy, because we know that there's some stuff happening in the world that doesn't qualify as all good. Okay, and this also doesn't give us a lot of room to change things, because we're out of touch with what the problems are, what needs to be changed. And so I think that the practical thing is optimism which is that you put a foot in that box and you look at the world just as it is, unflinchingly, but then you keep this other foot outside here in creative possibilities, in hope. And so this is where I live. And more precisely, I live at this place called Dancing Rabbit Eco Village. It's a sustainable living demonstration project. And what I say about Dancing Rabbit is that we import optimists and we export hope. And that hope is because we're actually meeting that 10% mark in some of the most important measurements that we have for what ecological sustainability might look like. And so I want to take you on a little tour of Dancing Rabbit and how we do this. So the first um, system I'm going to talk about is electricity. And so we use, for both our residences and most of our business activities, 14% of the electricity that your average American uses just for residential purposes. Okay, so it's not quite an apples to apples comparison because a bunch of our business stuff is in there as well, but we're going to go with 14%. We also have a net export commitment. What I mean by that is that, so what you're seeing here is this is one of our big solar installations, and we basically started our own solar-powered electric company. And this is what you can do when you collectivize with a bunch of people, there's 60 people who have all collectivized our efforts to do this. And we've made a commitment that we're going to send more green energy out onto the grid then we're bringing in off the grid. Okay? Now the cool thing about this, and the kind of subversive thing about this, is that on a nice sunny day in Missouri, our neighbors, who frankly could give a rat's ass about sustainability, when they turn on their lights, they're actually using green power. And we haven't had to convince anybody of anything. And so it's a way that when you collectivize, you can actually have more power to influence stuff without getting into arguments just by doing that collectivization and making values-based commitments to how you're interacting with that wider world. Okay, so that's electricity. That's the first one. second one is water. And we use about 19% of your average American's water, and over half of that is rainwater catchment off of our roofs. So we're at about 8.5% of municipal water use. And we do this in a number of ways. So one of the things, this is a composting toilet in this picture. Um, and so, you know, we do this weird thing in the U.S. So we live in a world where many, many people do not have access to potable water. And we crap in it. Okay, and so there's something that's a little ethically off about that. It's kind of insulting, right? And it also mixes together a clean resource with a dirty resource that actually isn't that dirty. It's actually useful if you don't mix it together with potable water. And so we've stepped back into a whole cycle with the natural world that humans, at least in the US, are disconnected from. You know, we're not part of that whole nutrient cycle anymore. And so we've stepped back into that nutrient cycle collectively and we're saving a bunch of water at the same time. So the second one is that we have very few lawns at Dancing Rabbit. In fact, we have one. We have one big lawn that's totally beautiful until about July, and then we let it die. Okay, and that's a value statement, letting the only lawn die. Right, the same way that keeping your lawn nice and emerald green in August or in a drought, you know, that's actually a value statement too. And so we actually use that as a demonstration when people come visit, they're like, why is the lawn all brown? It's like, well, because we're not watering it. And we think that that's important. So the third one that I'm gonna highlight is that we take showers when we need them. Okay, so that's not actually on some regimented 24-hour cycle. Like the daily shower and the whole culture around that is actually part of how we've gotten ourselves into some pretty serious 
ecological issues and some water issues. You know, and you're in a state that's got a major drought going on. And so what we do instead, at least during the summertime, is that we have this great swimming pond. And so we've taken showering and turned it into hanging out at the pond. And part of what we've done with that is that you know, showering is actually a fairly isolating routine. You, know, you go into this box by yourself, and you get all clean and get yourself all presentable, and then you come out of the box. Okay, so instead, what often happens at the end of the day is that somebody will grab a beer, go down to the pond, and hang out and turn that rinsing off at the end of a hot, sweaty day into social engagement and social routine with other people. And so there's multiple layers of what we're doing with some of this stuff, and one of them is moving from isolation to connection. Okay, so the next one is solid waste. So will you um, generate about 13% of the landfill waste? that your average American does. And there's, I don't know if you can see this, but the blue is Dancing Rabbit, the red is the US, and the green is Seattle. And I'll come back to why I'm picking on Seattle in a few minutes. Yep. Um, but you can see that we're much lower on the solid waste, the stuff that goes to the landfill. Um, we actually do a little more recycling than your average American. And so it's not that we're not bringing packaging into our homes, because we are, but we're being conscientious about what comes in, as well as what happens to it when it goes out. And the biggest discrepancy between our solid waste numbers and your average American is actually that we compost. And so 30% of what goes into the landfill from your average American is actually compostable stuff. So that's a big leverage point for making a big difference on this particular number. Okay, so the next one, and this is where we're gonna get into the numbers that affect our carbon footprint the most. And the whole second half of this talk is gonna be about carbon. Um, so we use about 1 20th of your average American's propane and natural gas. And this comes from a few things. One is that we have made a commitment that we're not going to use fossil fuels to heat our homes. You got to do it some other way. And so this happens in three different ways. One is that we do good passive solar design so that our houses don't need as much inputs in order to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, the other one is the stuff you can see here. Our cooking routines are really different. So this is actually a solar oven that lives on the commons in our community, so we have a big common area up by our common house that everybody shares, and you can get four or five families' meals into this oven. And so you put it in the oven, and what you can't see, there's actually aluminum foil on the other side of these wings that concentrates the sun's energy, and it's a way of cooking without using any fossil fuel inputs at all. And there's another thing that we do with cooking, and that is, has anybody heard of a hay box here? Is that familiar to, oh, this is my favorite sustainability gadget of all time. Okay, so this is a hay box. So all it is is a box that has insulation in it. And so this is one that was actually built for that purpose. For that purpose. The one that I have is an old cooler that no longer functions very well as a cooler, and a towel. And what you do is you get your food up to boiling, let it boil for a couple minutes. This is perfect for grains and really good for most beans. Get it up to boiling, take it off the heat, shove it in the box, put the towel around it, sort of tuck it in, and then close the lid, and come back a few hours later and you have perfectly cooked food. And this is great if you're like me. I can burn anything in the kitchen, we've discovered over the years. And so this is a great gadget for me because you can't burn anything in a hay box. Okay, so these are some of the ways that we actually get these numbers down. All right, so the next one is cars. So this is about the average American ratio of people to cars. We have 83 cars for every 100 people in the US. And that includes babies who are not driving. It's every 100 humans. Okay, so this is about the average ratio. And in reality, these four cars are actually shared by, this is about 2 thirds of the people who share those cars. So the most radical commitment that Dancing Rabbit has made is that you can't own and operate a personal vehicle if you live there. Okay, so that means we're pushed into doing a lot of sharing and cooperating with each other. So when one person goes to town, they will they'll do errands for five people. So instead of five trips running back and forth, we just have that one trip and that one amount of fossil fuels getting burned in order to do that trip. Okay, and we also don't have all these cars being manufactured. Okay, now I know that you've got in the Bay Area a really good car share program, so I want to emphasize that this is not something that is just done by rural communities out there in the middle of nowhere. So um, urban car share programs are actually one of the ways that we pioneered something in the intentional communities movement. Originally, the car sharing thing was something a lot of communities started doing and are, is now spread to a lot of urban environments and it's making a huge impact. 
also, they've done a study and a half a million cars have not been purchased, which means a half a million cars have not been manufactured because of urban car share programs. Because people get rid of their second car or they don't have a car at all because they're part of these programs. And this is even more impressive, for every car that's in a car share program, 32 sales are lost. Okay, so that's hugely impactful. So people look at us and they go, whoa, you've got 65 people sharing four cars. It's like, well, this is an even more impressive number. So in urban environments, you can actually scale this stuff up and get even larger benefits from employing these kinds of technologies. Okay, so the next one is food. So up until now, I've been able to give you really concrete numbers on Dancing Rabbit, and that's because there's a, um, we, we refer to her as our in-house anthropologist. There's a woman who actually got her master's uh, degree by doing research on Dancing Rabbit and developing tools for doing ecological auditing on intentional communities like ours. Um, her name is Brooke Jones. And um, what Brooke found when she got into it was that there's actually a couple categories that we want to be able to measure, and food is one of them, but they're very complicated, and so we are still working out exactly how to do that documentation. And so I'm not gonna give you numbers that I don't know are real, because I think groups sometimes overplay themselves, and I think that's one of the mistakes that we make in the sustainability movement, is bragging on things that aren't quite real. And so I don't wanna do that, but I am gonna give you what the principles are that we use that we know are bringing down our ecological footprint, but I don't know exactly how close to that 10% mark we are in this. So the principles that we use are local, organic, and low on the food chain. Okay, and so those are gonna be familiar to most of you that have thought about sustainability before. There's nothing new here. But I wanna give you a little bit of information about how impactful those things can be. Um, and so this is the um, greenhouse gas emissions from the American diet. So 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions are from red meat alone. So that's gonna be beef, pork, and lamb. So if you wanna make an impact bringing your carbon emissions down, that's the place to do the reduction that is gonna have the biggest impact. And that's also not news to a lot of people. What's interesting to me though is that light blue section up there at the top. Drinks, oils, snacks, et cetera, 25%. Now a chunk of that is oils, but the rest of that is junk food. Like heavily packaged, heavily manufactured junk food. And that's pretty interesting because you know what happens with a lot of things like potato chips, for instance. Like the potatoes are grown somewhere and they're shipped somewhere. So that's a carbon footprint that happens. And then there's the oil, and then there's wherever the salt came from, and then there's whatever the sour cream and onion flavoring is on it, and where all that come from, and it gets processed and reprocessed and packaged, and then it gets shipped somewhere else, and it sits in a warehouse for a while, and then it gets shipped to your store, and then you drive to get it. So junk food is actually hugely impactful in terms of our carbon footprints, and it's about convenience. And so one of the stories that we have about ourselves is that convenience is sort of our right and it's sort of a natural thing to be striving for and striving for, but this is part of how that, that piece of our worldview sort of feeds into being very impactful on the environment. Okay, so the second one, you know, if you sort of slice that pie in a different way and you look at like the food on the one hand and then the transportation, so 11% of the carbon emissions from our food is just driving the stuff around. Okay, so this is why local is so important. So you can like shave um, you know, up to 10% off of your carbon footprint with food just by getting as much stuff locally as you can. So then the third category is organic. Now, I don't know if you can see this detail, but this is a side-by-side -side comparison of 30 years of data comparing organic growing and conventional growing. Conveniently, they labeled the organic one green so that you won't forget what you're looking at during this. I love that. Um, so one of the interesting things about this chart, so the yields is in the upper left up there, um, is that both organic and conventional supporters will often claim that the yields are so much higher with this, but it's actually not really true. Like there are particular techniques that can create higher yields, but overall, organic and conventional are very well matched in terms of the yields. Where you get the impact though is on those next two categories, the energy inputs, which organic is noticeably lower, and the greenhouse gases, where it's really lower. And if you're interested, if you have people here who have an interest in agriculture for a living, um, organic is actually much more profitable per acre per year. Okay, so that's where, that's where the advantages for organic growing come in. Now there's also been a number of really interesting studies that have been coming out in the last few years that have been talking about the potential impact of going to organic farming and the impacts that it can have not just on sustainability but on other issues. Um, so these are two articles, one by the UN and one by the World Watch Institute. 
And I want to share with you the first couple paragraphs from the um, World Watch Institute article. They say, the only people who think organic farming can feed the world are delusional hippies, that must be me, hysterical moms, right, that's me, and self-righteous organic farmers, right? Actually, no. A fair number of agribusiness executives, agricultural and ecological scientists, and international agriculture experts believe that a large-scale shift to organic farming would not only increase the world's food supply, but might be the only way to eradicate hunger. Because there's a lot of tie-ins between sustainability and other social issues that we care a lot about. And so this is just one of them. Like our farming methods that are good for the planet are also actually good for how we do food distribution because most organic farms are going to be smaller and they're going to be local. And so what they're really studying is local small farms when they're doing this that are organic. Okay, so the other category that's really hard to measure accurately are buildings. And um, I want to make a couple points about this. One of them is, if you look at these buildings, were, these are three buildings of Dancing Rabbit. You know they're beautiful, actually. And we have a lot of pretty sustainable buildings out there that are pretty but ugly. You know, and I don't think this is helping the sustainability movement much. You know, if we don't have images that draw us in and that get us excited about living inside those buildings, then they're going to be less appealing. And so one of the things about these buildings is that they're lovely. The other thing is that they're more sustainable. And so um, these are the four main uh, categories for how you determine how sustainable a building is. So there's the materials it's built from, how far those materials came, the efficiency of the building, and the square footage. And so I'm going to go through each one of them. And I'm going to use my own house as an example. And this is actually one of my walls. It's a straw bale house. This is one of my walls before we put a plaster on it. So when you build a straw bale house, you put the straw bales up, and then you put a nice plaster on top of it that makes like a hard sort of coating on top of it. Um, and so those straw bales came from 22 miles away from a farmer that we've been working with for the last 10 years to actually know how to do straw bales in a good way so they can be used for building materials because you can't just use any straw bale. So 22 miles. And then that post that you can see there actually came three miles um, from another intentional community that's just down the road from us. So we're cooperating between the communities. Uh, and all of the big framing in my house came from just three miles away. Now this is actually not my house, but it's really cool looking, so I wanted to throw it in here. Um, but I have these same things. So this is the plaster that you can see, and then that glass. And so the plaster, uh, we have very clay soil at Dancing Rabbit. It's crappy for farming, and it's great for natural building. Okay, and so when we built my house, we dug out a bunch of clay to put the foundation in. So we slapped it in the pile, and then it sat there for six or seven months until we were ready to put the plaster on and then brought it back over, mixed it together with straw and sand, which is the main elements in plaster, and then put it right back up on those walls. And so that clay traveled somewhere between three and 20 feet from where it was for a long time onto the walls. These are very, very local materials and a good example of how different areas are gonna have different solutions to sustainability problems. Not everywhere has clay, and so that's not gonna be a local material everywhere, but it happens to be where we are. Now the glass that you can see came 1,842 feet, which is the walking distance from the community recycling center out to where my building site was. And so I went up to the community recycling center and cherry picked a bunch of bottles and smashed them up and turned them into mosaics. And so you can get really creative with natural materials like this and also reuse materials that are being created right inside wherever you're building. So that's the natural building end of the spectrum. Now, this is another style of building that we use at Dancing Rabbit. Can you tell what this was originally? Bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a school bus. You know, God, what a hippie stereotype, right? They live in school buses. Um, actually, this is the only one we have at Dancing Rabbit. Um, so yeah, so this building started its life out as a school bus. And um, the young woman who built this building decided she really wanted to play with this reuse concept. And so this little house actually has 18 different reuse elements in it. Everything from, there's a, um, a vacuum hose that was used for the water catchment. When it comes off of the roof, it runs through an old vacuum hose down into her water catchment. The water catchment barrels themselves were reused, and the school bus, of course, is also reused. She also did a really cool rad thing, which is that this building is actually insulated with raw wool that came from a local farmer. So you can take raw wool and sort of fluff it up 
and gently stick it into a wall cavity, and it turns out that just like a wool sweater is good insulation for you, raw wool is actually really excellent insulation for houses already. So this is one of the ways that we've been kind of experimenting with different local materials in our area. And so this last house actually pulls all those things together. So uh, it's got a uh, passive solar design. So there's a greenhouse on the south side and then active solar on the roof that's for the electricity. Uh, it's got a rainwater catchment barrel over there. That's another example of the reuse stuff. And it's a little straw bale building. And this building is 230 square feet. Okay, so that sounds small, right? So that's actually what the average housing was in the 1950s. So our grandparents lived with an average of 230 square feet of personal space. And now it's about 750 square feet in the US. And so just in a couple generations, we've sort of biggered all sorts of things. It's not just McDonald's that keeps biggering things. It's also our housing and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so this is an example of us moving back toward having smaller buildings. And the square footage on your house is actually the biggest factor for how sustainable it is. So you simply downsize the house that you're living in, that's gonna make a big difference because it takes fewer inputs to keep a small space heated or cooled than it does to keep a big space heated and cooled. Okay, so this is a great example of bringing all those things together. Okay, so I'm gonna get off of the, um, the ecological stuff and talk about a little more of the social and economic stuff that's happening at Dancing Rabbit. So the first thing I wanna introduce is a concept of timeless work. So timeless work are those things that have been happening cross-culturally for millennia. So this is stuff like growing food, creating shelter, healing, ministering, you know, all that kind of stuff. The arts, all that stuff has been around cross-culturally. And one of the interesting things that happens when you try to localize things more is that you need those skills suddenly to be right in your local town, your local village. And so one of the things that I didn't really anticipate when I first moved into intentional communities, which is almost 20 years ago now, was that my life sort of swung the pendulum toward a lot of this timeless work stuff. And that's actually been really cool. So I, you know, I am a white American, and part of what that means for me is that I don't necessarily have a terrific sense of roots and of like long history in a place. You know, that last panel was talking a lot about place, and so I don't really have that sense of like my ancestors have always been in the same place that I've been in. Um, and the cool thing about this timeless work thing is that it's put me in touch with, oh, I'm doing the same things that my grandmother was doing and that her grandmother was doing and her grandmother was doing. And so it's helped me get a stronger sense of that lineage and sense of rootedness. So not everything that we do is timeless at DR though. So people sometimes think that it's about checking out of technology and it's not actually. So we do a fair bit of this, not actually outside of the lawn, it was just kind of a cool picture. Uh, but, you know, obviously I'm traveling around the country, I'm using microphones, I'm on the train, I'm using my computer. So it's not about checking out from technology, but it's really about finding the balance between that timelessness and the technology and doing that very deliberately. And we're not necessarily doing it at the level that like our Mennonite and Amish neighbors are doing it very deliberately, um, but really thinking it through and looking at like, is this technology going to actually empower my life, make me happier, have me feel more connected, be more sustainable. It's asking all of those questions about that stuff and figuring out what the right balance point is. So that's a lot of the dance that we do in the community that I live in is between those two poles, between technology and timelessness. Okay, so I started out, you know, I put up that slide of like, we think it's gonna suck, right? So I wanna give you some of the reasons why it doesn't suck to live a dancing rabbit, and these are some of them. So by, again, collectivizing and by being a village, we are able to afford things like we have this big playing field that's in almost constant use in the summer. Uh, we have our own dance hall. Um, and we actually have a bar and restaurant right in the community. And we are rumored to have the best beer in the county, which is not that hard in <laughs> northeastern Missouri, frankly. But it's true. We actually have the best beer in the county. Okay? And so there's all these things that make life really fun. And then there's a lot of ways that we're sort of engaging in timeless fun as well. You know, so like we got a picture up here of sledding and that was something that my grandmother was doing and her grandmother was doing and sort of on back. And so also like sort of looking at ways that we can get simpler in how we entertain ourselves and how we make ourselves happy. And um, this number, 88% of people at Dancing Rabbit say it's a good or extremely good place to live. And so that number's now been verified with two different independent studies. Both of them come out with the numbers just about there. And that's actually the same numbers as Seattle. 
I don't know if you remember earlier, like how high Seattle's numbers were. I tease them when I go up there about like that being coffee cups is what that's about. Um, <laughs> that's like the Starbucks issue. Um, so, you know, which isn't actually what it's about in Seattle. So part of why I can pick on Seattle, though, is that they actually are conscious enough that they've done some measurements, so we actually can do that kind of comparisons. But I want us to be comparing ourselves to places that are actually really good places to live. It's not like living in an eco-village like the one that I live in is some kind of consolation prize, you know, because life was too hard or something. Like, that's really not what it's about. It's really about, like, let's live a really high-quality life. Okay, so here's another one of those great myths. So I have friends from high school that every time I talk to them about sustainability, their attitude is kind of like, you know, I just, I need to keep working for a few more years, get a little more money in the bank, and then I'll be able to start thinking about the sustainability thing. And one of the great things that we've learned at Dancing Rabbit is that you actually don't need a ton of money in order to do this stuff. So we're living on an average of, you know, less than a quarter of your average American's annual income. And part of what that means is that we're working a lot fewer hours. So people at Dancing Rabbit work about 20 hours a week to earn the money that they need to earn to live the life that they want to live. And that is really different from working 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week, sometimes at a job you hate, to try to make enough money to sort of tuck your life in that you really want to do on the weekends. And that's what a lot of people are sort of stuck in at this point. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge that like actually you don't need a lot of money and you don't need a lot of income in order to do this. If, again, you're part of a collective, which you know, lets us bring down our expenses in a whole bunch of ways. And so this is the formula of life at Dancing Rabbit. So 10% of the resources, all the happiness, a quarter of the income, and we're actually living our values. So my life is this pretty coherent whole, like how I'm doing my housing, how I'm doing my work, how I schooled my son, all the stuff, how I do my spiritual practice, like all of that is very coherent and I'm having to work a lot fewer hours in order to pull that off. And so it's not just about it doesn't suck, it actually is a pretty terrific life that we're living at Dancing Rabbit. And that's what I want to invite you to consider is that you have options for how you set your life up. All right, so how do we pull this off? So um, this is what I call the four C's that are key points in sustainability. And I'm actually gonna lump these first two, creativity and courage together. And you know, remember this box we had at the beginning of the talk? So, when you have one foot outside of the box, you know what this foot is doing? It's making shit up. Because there's like no path, you know? There's no formula for how you do what doesn't yet exist in the world. And so there's a lot of creativity that goes into doing the kind of life that we're doing. And it's like daily and it sort of infuses itself in many, many aspects of how we do our lives. So creativity is a big one. The other thing is that this actually takes a fair bit of courage because, you know, you can't justify this foot. Okay, what's justifiable is in this box. That's the stuff that you can point to and go, this is how we're supposed to do our lives. Well, this actually takes kind of bucking that wider culture in a lot of ways. And we still have, we have members that go home at the holidays and their family is like, are you still living in that crazy place? <laughs> you know, like people don't get you when you get off that beaten path. And probably a lot of you, I mean, you probably wouldn't be at in this school if you weren't oriented in that direction in general. Um, so you probably had some experience with people going like, what are you doing going to that crazy place? Well, that's, I, I live in that crazy place. Okay, so that's creativity and courage. Um, so the next one is compassion. And folks think of compassion as being really closely linked to empathy, which is definitely true. That sort of walking in another person's shoes. But I want to highlight a very particular version of compassion that relates directly to sustainability. And that's this. So our ecological choices are not ethically neutral. Okay, so the choices of how I live my life affect the people around me, they affect my country, they affect the whole globe actually. And the US by itself is responsible for like just our energy choices are 12% of global, global carbon emissions. So our choices are really not ethically neutral. And so what I think compassion means is can you let the fact that your choices affect other people affect your choices? You know, because a lot of us are not seeing those impacts from climate change that directly in our own lives now. Now that's starting to shift and California's getting hit with it right now and out west from all the fires we're starting to get hit with it. But for most of us, our lives have been able to sort of carry on 
relatively normally. And that is not true for everybody around the globe. So can you let the fact that you know that affect what you're doing? Okay, so that, I think, is what compassion actually means right now. It's not a soft thing. It is actually a pretty intense sort of moral compass that I think we can all be following at this point. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about compassion, really letting it affect your decisions. So the fourth one, and I call this the mother of all sustainability skills, cooperation. Um, so Dancing Rabbit couldn't be doing what we're doing without a lot of cooperation. So we can build our houses smaller and not have it feel like deprivation because we share a common house. So everybody has access to 2,500 square feet of indoor space, particularly in the winter, that's important. You know, there's a big living room, there's showers, there's a kitchen, there's bathrooms. There's all kinds of stuff that you don't have to build in your house, which is part of why we live on less money, is that we're not maintaining all those systems in everybody's individual house. But it takes cooperation. You've got to manage a building. You've got to stumble over 60 other people's habits when you're doing that. We share land. We share cars. You know, it's a big one for Americans. Like, cars are sort of our symbol of independence in a lot of ways. And so if you have to share cars and do that kind of coordination, that takes a lot of cooperation. Okay. So this is one of the keys to actually getting us down to that 10% mark is like, can you cooperate with each other? It's about cooperation, sharing, making decisions together, and finding some way to resolve conflicts that doesn't involve bombing each other, or the emotional equivalent to that, which is basically what our culture does. That's the end game of how we resolve conflicts. It's not sustainable. Bombing people, not sustainable. Okay, so we have to find other ways to practice different skills. And living in community is a great place to do it, and it's a place where we see the direct benefits of getting good at cooperation. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears for the second half of this talk, and I'm going to talk a lot about climate change, but I want you to sort of keep in mind those four C's as we go through here, because there's going to be different places where that's going to pop up again. So we're going to switch gears into the bad news at this point. So, um, you know, I, I do this talk kind of backwards. They tell you in public speaking conventional wisdom that I'm supposed to scare the crap out of you first, and then I give you my brilliant solution, all right? Um, so I've already given you a chunk of what I think the solution is, or at least one strong aspect of it. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about the gloom and doom. And um, I want to tell you a story. So I travel a lot for work, and I do it on the train, partly because of the carbon emissions. Um, and I, was, I, I do this thing where you go through these gorgeous, amazing places when you're on the train. And my personal recreation involves staring out of the windows and going all gaga about the natural world, one of the things I do. Uh, and I was doing this about a year and a half ago, and I was in a place that I don't get to that often, uh, probably been seven or eight years since the last time I'd been through there. And as I was looking out the window, I suddenly thought, you know, I might never see this again, the way that I'm seeing it right now. If it takes me another seven or eight years to get back here, I might not actually see this again. And it sort of landed in my body in a way that it occasionally lands in my body, what's going on with climate change. And this was the thought that came right on the heels of that. We have actually changed the climate. Holy shit. We've actually changed the climate. Because, you know, climate's a big deal. Climate is not like, oh, honey, the weather just changed. You know, climate is what has builders know how to build buildings. And it's what has parents know how to dress their children so they don't die of hypothermia. And most importantly, it's how farmers know how to grow our food. So changing the climate is actually a really big deal, and it's far beyond just the weather's getting a little weird. Okay, it's a very, very big deal. And I want to give you one science slide. Okay, I think this is the only one that you really need to understand in order to get what's happening. So this is 800,000 years of data. Thank God we have geologists who can figure out this stuff. Um, so the upper part of this, the blue line, is carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. And the white line down at the bottom is temperature fluctuations on the planet. And the interesting thing about this slide is that when you hear people who are labeled climate deniers say, but we've always had fluctuations in temperature, they are absolutely right. That is absolutely true. We have always had temperature fluctuations on the planet. But the part that they're missing is that they track really, really closely with carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. So if you look at that blue line and the white line, they look pretty similar to each other. And 
for these 800,000 years, the carbon concentrations have stayed between 180 and 300 parts per million, which is how one of the ways that scientists measure concentration of things. And in 2013, we were already up at 400 parts per million. So what you see with this is that we have an unprecedented level of greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere already, and we keep churning them out. It's gone up since 2013. It's not like it leveled off at that point. Okay, so what that means is we are headed for a big temperature spike, and we're seeing the front edge of it right now. We're at, we've just had eight tenths of a degree on average rise in the temperature from this already. Okay, so we're already seeing the front edge of that. Now, I've been tracking this for a long time. I was 17 years old when this article came out on Time Magazine, and this is when I first got exposed to what we used to call global warming at that point, or the greenhouse effect. You see the, the little logo is like the greenhouse effect logo. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed in that time is this thing that I call the incredible shrinking timeline. So we've actually had climate <clears throat> scientists since the 1800s, which I didn't know until I started doing research for this talk. It's actually a very old field within science. And in the 1800s, they were sort of noticing, oh, well, we're putting these things up into the atmosphere. And what they were saying at that point was like, something interesting might happen if we keep doing that. It wasn't really alarm at that point that they were experiencing. It was just like, oh, this is an interesting thing to note. Like at some point that could really start affecting things. We're not exactly sure how. Well, if you fast forward 100 years to the 1970s, at that point the client scientists were starting to say things like, you know, in a couple centuries we're going to start seeing some really negative effects. Okay, so this is when I was a toddler. We already knew that information. In 1987, when that Time Magazine article come, came out, they had um, pulled that timeline into about the end of this century. Like, we're going to see some serious effects. But, you know, that was still outside of the lifetimes of everybody. And so that's a little less real. So in 2012, there were a bunch of scientists who got together, a bunch of data that was sort of collated together. And that's when you started to hear 2050 or 2030 being put out. And that's the number often that you see policymakers keying off of for their stuff. So I'm going to pause and read you a couple paragraphs out of this book. This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. Uh, and then I'll go back to, she'll drop us back in the rest of the slide in a minute. Um, so I think this is one of the most important books that's come out in the last few years. And she gets into the subtitle of this is the, um, Capitalism Versus the Climate. So she's a very strong economic analysis of why we are where we are. Um, so what she says is, the challenge is not simply that we need to spend a lot of money and change a lot of policies. It's that we need to think differently, radically differently, for those changes to be remotely possible. Now, again, if you were here for that last presentation, you could hear echoes of that in what the two gentlemen were saying. Right now, the triumph of market logic with its ethos of domination and fierce competition is paralyzing almost all serious efforts to respond to climate change. Cutthroat competition between nations has deadlocked UN climate negotiations for decades. Rich countries dig in their heels and declare that they won't cut carbon emissions and risk losing their vaulted position in the global hierarchy. Poorer countries declare that they won't give up their right to pollute as much as rich countries did on their way to wealth, even if it means deepening a disaster that hurts the poor the most of all. For any of this to change, a worldview will need to rise to the fore that sees nature, other nations, and our own neighbors not as adversaries, but rather as partners in a grand project of mutual reinvention. So that's what Dancing Rabbit's about. I'm gonna interrupt myself for a second here and say like, we're in that sort of grand project of reinvention. Like how do you relate to your neighbors? How do you relate to nature? From a fundamental worldview kind of a place. So she continues. That reinvention is a big ask, but it gets bigger. Because of our endless delays, we have to pull off this massive transformation without further delay. The International Energy Agency warns that if we do not get our emissions under control by a rather terrifying 2017, our fossil fuel economy will lock in extremely dangerous warming. Quote, the energy-related infrastructure then in place will generate all the CO2 emissions allowed in our carbon budget for limiting warming to two degrees Celsius leaving no room for additional power plants, factories, and other infrastructure unless they're zero carbon, which would be extremely costly." End quote. This assumes, probably accurately, that governments would be unwilling to force the closure of still profitable power plants and factories. As Faith Burrell, the IEA's chief economist, bluntly puts it, the door to reach two degrees 
is about to close. In 2017, it will be closed forever. In short, we have reached what some activists have started calling decade zero of the climate crisis. We either change now or we lose our chance. Okay, so that shrinking window, that shrinking timeline is exactly why I'm willing to spend five months out of this year away from the home I love talking to people about climate change because we are in a very, very narrow window. And the goal that they're talking about is two degrees Celsius. And the reason why that's important is that there's a whole bunch of feedback loops that they're predicting are gonna kick in when we get to the two degrees Celsius mark. So for instance, just one of them, there's a whole bunch of methane that's stored in a bunch of those glaciers. And methane is actually a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon is. And as those glaciers melt, that's gonna get released pretty suddenly into the atmosphere. And we're not actually sure what's gonna happen at, the, at that point, but they think two degrees Celsius might keep us from going into that scenario where there's that fast acceleration. Okay, so two degrees Celsius is important. And this is the kind of stuff that we're seeing. And these slides are always in here. This is California, um, where we're experiencing drought right now. So you all know this better than I do what's been happening here. But the interesting thing is that it's not drought everywhere. I mean, a lot of people call it climate disruption because it just sort of disrupts whatever your local weather patterns are. And for me, um, I'm in Missouri, and they actually are saying that we're going to be warmer and wetter rather than warmer and drier where I am. And I don't know about you, but I have this funny little part of my brain that kind of wants to play games with that. So I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and sort of feel like I did my time with winter. And so I hear warmer and wetter, and I start thinking like, you know, that might actually be pretty cool. You know, it's like I'm going to be living in some kind of tropical paradise in Missouri. And I start thinking, like, break out the pina coladas, dude. That sounds great. Okay, and a lot of us do this. A lot of us, like, sort of play games with that and think in terms of weather rather than thinking in terms of climate. Because even if it's warmer and wetter and I get to drink more pina coladas, I also don't know how to grow food anymore where I am. Okay, so it's important for us to not go to pina coladas with this. Okay, I want to give you a different analogy that I think is actually closer to realistic. And that is this. So how, who in here has ever had a fever? Yeah, so that's kind of a universal experience, right? And so you can know what it feels like to be inside a living system that is running a temperature that's higher than it's supposed to run. So I took the liberty of translating Celsius into Fahrenheit and then t um, sticking that on top of your average human body temperature to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. Um, so right now, we're um, a little bit less than one degree Celsius rise already. And so what we're experiencing right now is about the equivalent of a 100 degree fever in the human body. Now, most of us can still go to work, still go to school with a 100 degree fever. You know, it's actually not that bad. And that's what we've got right now. So whatever disruption we're currently experiencing, it's the human body equivalent of like, it's not so bad. So two degrees, which is what we're currently pretty much committed to, is in the human body the equivalent of a 102 degree fever. And I'm flat on my back with 102 degree fever. Even if there's nothing else going on, that's the point where it starts getting really debilitating. And that's what we're locked into right now. So the more conservative climate scientists say that what we're headed for if we don't clean up our act is at least six degrees Celsius, which is the equivalent in the human body of 109 degrees. So humans start to die at like 105, 106. So we don't really want to know what 109 degree being inside a living system running that kind of fever is gonna be like. Now the less conservative climate scientists who what we've seen is every few years they get upgraded to the conservative ones, you know, are talking more like 11 degrees Celsius. Okay, now this is a little bit of an unfair analogy because we have lots and lots of data points about what happens to the human body when we get a fever. We've got multiple data points just in this room. We don't have multiple data points for what happens when you do this to the earth. Okay, but we are in that experiment right now and we're barreling toward it being a very serious experiment. And you know what that makes me want to do? Doesn't that make you want to do that? Yeah, I, I think this is what we do. Because when you really put your attention on what's happening with climate change, and you leave it there long enough to feel what starts to come up, it is scary as hell. Okay? And so I think that we do this not because we don't care, but because we care so much that it hurts, that it's terrifying. 
It brings up grief and anger and shame. You know, for those of us who are in the U.S. and have contributed a lot to this, there's a whole jumble of emotions that come up, and then it's easier to sort of look at it for a minute and then kind of check out. And so I think this is where we're at right now culturally. And one of the things that I think we need to do is to actually feel the emotions and actually deal with the spiritual implications of what's happening and really spend time looking at that stuff and working through it. Because you know, if you've ever been in a fight with a romantic partner, when your emotions are really up, like you're not thinking clearly. Like nobody thinks clearly when there's emotions rattling around that intensely. And so that's what we're doing right now is we're not thinking very clearly about what we're doing. And I think it's this phenomenon that has us not thinking very clearly. And so unfortunately, because we live in a culture that doesn't teach us very well how to deal with our emotions, this is one of the first things that I think needs to happen. So we need to actually dig into doing that work. And then there's a lot of other stuff that we can be doing once we're back in that place where we're thinking more clearly. And so um, this is a model of um, effective social change from Joanna Macy. Um, and what she says is that every successful social movement has had these three things happening. So holding actions are those things. It's like stopping more bad stuff from happening. Systems change is exactly what it sounds like. It's like you either change how you're interacting with the system, or you reinvent the system, or you embody a different system, but somehow or another you change the system that's in place. And then the last one is that worldview change. And part of that is doing that emotional work. It's like we, we shift our perspective on how we should be interacting with our emotions. That's a version of worldview change, but really fundamentally looking at those lenses that we're seeing the whole thing through. So I'm gonna walk through examples of each one of these. Um, so the first one is holding actions. And so this is gonna be stopping the Keystone Pipeline, stopping fracking, this is your protests, this is your legal actions. Like all of those things are examples of holding actions. And I want you to look at the slide for a minute, these slides, and tell me what you notice about them. They're not white people. Mm -hmm. That's right, these are not white people. And I promise you I did not cherry pick the only three slides with people of color that were available on the internet. Um, the point of putting this up here is that um, the most impressive and effective holding actions that have happened over the last decade have been primarily led by people of color most often indigenous people. And this is all over the world. And there's actually this um, sort of horrific statistic that I just came across, which is that every week on average, two people die in climate change related protests. And 60% of those people are indigenous people. And so the point of this is that we would be most likely well over the two degree mark at this point if it wasn't for people of color. So when we think about environmental activism, you know, we often think of that as being a liberal white thing. Okay, and part of it is our language, and I'm not terrific about the languaging of this either, but the point is, in reality, what's happening on the ground is that white people owe an incredible debt of gratitude to people of color at this point. And so I wanna celebrate that and say that we're actually cutting ourselves off from a lot of allyship by not being able to work across those lines. So I think this is an important piece. Okay, so the next one is systems change. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of different ways that we can do this. And the first one that I wanna highlight is, and these are a few, a few examples of like how we don't actually have to change our political or economic system, we can work within it right now. Um, so one of the most interesting um, legislative things that's happening is being led by an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby. And um, CCL has done a really radical thing of thinking that Republicans are people. Okay, this doesn't often happen on the left and in our environmental circles. You know, there's often this sort of enemy making that happens and like the more progressive end of the spectrum sort of demonizes the other end of the spectrum. And CCL has decided that's kind of a bad idea. If we actually want a world that works for everybody, maybe we need to include everybody in that process. And so they did a cool thing where they sat down and they sort of analyzed the basic value systems on both ends of both sides of the aisle and came up with a bill that actually works for the philosophies of both parties. Okay, so the first thing is that instead of banning behavior, it uses a market force for it, which is much more appealing to conservatives than just banning something and saying you're not allowed to do it. And so the idea is that you tax carbon when it comes out of the ground. You slap a big tax on it. And then the second part is the part that progressives really love. What you do with that money is that you distribute it evenly across all U.S. citizens. This is, if it's a U.S. version and not a global bill. Okay. 
And they like this because it's basically a radical income redistribution thing. And it means that poor people will actually have the money to deal with the fact that things are going to go up at the pump. You know, gasoline is going to be more expensive if we do this. Natural gas, electricity is going to be more expensive if we do this. And so that gives a way to have this not be really regressive for poor people. And the thing that both Republicans and Democrats are liking is it also encourages good behavior. So Republicans are big on self-responsibility. It's why they hate welfare, okay? Because they want you to be self-responsible. Well, this is going like, okay, let's create a way for people to be more self-responsible in relation to environmental issues. Okay, so it's a bill that actually hits on a lot of different fronts. And so there's a number of carbon tax bills out there, but this is the one that I think is the one that's most worth throwing your support behind. So if you're into doing lobbying stuff, CCL does great volunteer training and gives you the tools to actually go in and have conversations with your senators. And I've actually done it. I'm a CCL volunteer back in Missouri. And it's actually a lot more fun, and they were a lot more receptive than I was expecting them to be. So for whatever it's worth, this is a good place to put some of that political energy. So the other thing that we can do is incentivize the right stuff. So we still put billions of dollars a year into subsidizing the fossil fuel industries. And that's a bad place to be putting our subsidies if we want a planet that works. Okay, so subsidizing green energy is a better way to do that. The other one that we can do is divestment. I was actually just down at Chico State, which was the first university in the country to fully divest from fossil fuels. Um, so there's a number of universities and churches, and what this basically means is just pulling your money out of investments in fossil fuel companies. So if anybody in here has your own portfolio or your parents have a portfolio, like taking the time to actually look at it and find out, are you actually benefiting from the fossil fuel industry at this point. And the nice thing about divestment is that it puts ethical pressure onto these companies. And this was a huge part of what got um, the South African government to back down from apartheid. Divestment was a big part of that social movement. And so it has a good track record of you know, putting pressure in the right places in order to get them to change what they're doing. Okay, so the second one, and this gets into actually rethinking the systems, is rethinking our economy. And so these are a couple good books for that. This changes everything that I was just reading out of. Um, and Bill McKibben's Deep Economy. Um, that name may be familiar. He's the 350.org guy if you've been tracking carbon stuff. And so this is some of what I mean by that. So capitalism is an interesting thing because it actually has a couple purposes to it. So one of them is the same purpose that any economic system has, which is the exchange of goods, moving goods and services around. Okay, and it does that well. However, it also has this other purpose, and it's where its name comes from, which is that it's about accumulating capital. You know, the myth, the story around capitalism is that if you play the game effectively, you will be able to accrue wealth. Okay, so that's the story. That's kind of the American dream in a lot of ways. And so that's one of the purposes of capitalism. But where that wealth comes from is from extracting value from a couple places. Okay, so it doesn't just come out of thin air. So it comes out of the earth. So when those fossil fuels come out, like right now there's no real accounting for the value of those other than what the market says the value is. Okay, and there was an interesting study that just came out recently where they looked at um, different industries around the world and what they realized was that if we actually accounted for the environmental costs of things, there would be no like zero profitable industries currently operating in the world. Okay, so all the major industries are not doing a very good job of taking this into account right now. And that's where the wealth and capitalism comes from, is that's discrepancy between the actual value and the value that they have to pay in order to use those resources. The other place that we extract from is human labor. So all these companies that are freaking out about a $15 an hour minimum wage are freaking out because we're looking at not letting them extract quite as much from people in order to feed their bottom line. And so this is built right into the basic structure of capitalism. So we could rethink that. Like That's not the only economic system that's out there. We could actually take that on and look at reinventing how we deal with the economy. So the other thing that, whoops, oh, here's the other problem with it. This is the climate change version of it. So um, right now, we could, if we're going to stay under the two degree mark, we can burn about 565 gigatons, which is still a lot, of fossil fuels. What companies currently have the rights to burn is five times that amount. 
So they are well within their legal and economic rights to be doing this. And so we're going to have to challenge those legal and economic rights if we're going to keep that stuff from being burned. Okay, so that's the total value of, or the total amount that either companies, fossil fuel companies, or countries that act as fossil fuel companies, or some countries that do this directly, some governments. And so we're going to need to put some pressure on keeping that stuff from being burned if we're going to keep it under the two degree mark. So that means fundamentally rethinking what your rights are economically if you're a big business. <clears throat> okay, so um, we talked some about values already. The other thing that we could be rethinking is how we measure things economically. So right now, um, a healthy economy is one with a high, with a large gross national product or gross domestic product. And what that basically means is just how many dollars have flown around. measurement so um, so right now we measure it with gross national product gross domestic product um, however that's not necessarily how we have to measure the health of our culture okay so there's a small country named Bhutan and what they measure in Bhutan is gross national happiness okay so they've actually created ways to measure that and that's what the government is responsible for sustaining not economic growth economic growth economic growth Okay, so we could really be fundamentally rethinking a bunch of this stuff about how we do our economy and how we relate to the economy. Okay, so then that brings us to embodying a different system. So this is what we do at Dancing Rabbit. Okay, is it's about embodying that different way of being. So lifestyle changes is basically what we're talking about. And these are five places that are big leverage points for this that you can implement without having to live in an eco-village. Okay, so number one is drive less and don't fly. So flying has the largest carbon footprint of any kind of transportation mode that we currently have. And there's very few places that you have to go to that you have to fly to. And we're very, very casual about hopping on planes. That's again that convenience thing. It's just like the lots of packaging. It's the same thing with flying. It is very convenient to hop on a plane and it's doing a good job of contributing to destroying the planet. Okay, so really looking at your transportation. Um, switching to green energy. So getting on solar panels or wind, and whether this is collectivizing with a bunch of people in your neighborhood and doing what we did and like putting up a bunch of solar panels together, you can do collectivization without having to live in a community, or lobbying your local company, whatever that is, or just using less electricity is also a good way to get at this one. Um, we've already talked about less meat and more organics, and then there's just consuming less in general. So every time you buy something, there's a carbon footprint attached to that. Okay, so I've been all over the country, and one of the things I'm amazed at the vibrancy of is the storage unit business. Okay, you know, we're not even using our crap. Like, we're sticking it in rooms and keeping it air-conditioned. You know, and that's a little crazy. You know, so we could just buy less crap. You know, or buy used stuff. You know, so consumption is what sort of runs our economy in a lot of ways, is rampant consumption. So just consuming less. Um, and then finally, localizing. So it's not just about your food, but also how close are you to work or to school? Um, how much does your entertainment make you drive across the bay on a regular basis? You know, really looking at how much you can get your life centralized into one neighborhood that's walkable or bikeable distance. And then there's this other key leverage point. Um, which is collectivizing. And so I want to encourage you, like if what I've been talking about with Dancing Rabbit sounds really appealing to you, to consider actually living in an intentional community and doing this full-on collectivization. And the organization that is the sort of go-to for information about that is the Fellowship for Intentional Community. Um, and the reason why this is important, I'm just going to give you like my own version of this story. Um, so I've lived, I've been tracking my personal ecological footprint for about 15 years. 
and I've lived in a bunch of different circumstances in those 15 years. And what I found is that it's actually not that hard to bring your ecological footprint down by 30, even 40% of the average American. That's really about just being conscientious. It's not heroics. And then there's another 10 to 20% that's hard. You know, that you really have to work at it, but that you can still pull off being sort of an independent operator by yourself. And then I have personally, I'm the exact same person, I have personally never been able to figure out how to get that other 20 to 30% down so that I'm at that 10% mark, other than when I've lived in a community that does a lot of sharing. Okay, so that cooperation thing is the key leverage point. And so part of what that message is is, don't feel like you can't do a bunch right now, because you can. But at some point, if we're really going to get down to that 10% mark, we're all going to have to look at getting more collective about what we're doing. OK, so that brings us to this world of you work piece, which is a little bit esoteric, but I'm going to try to like make it really, really concrete for you. So this is reinventing the sort of fundamental lenses that we have and how we see the world, reinventing our relationships with ourselves, doing that emotional work, with each other, how we relate to our neighbors, and with the planet. And I'm gonna focus just on one piece of that, and that is that I really believe this, that we only act on behalf of what we love. So fear and anger are like, those are okay motivators for sort of short-term cleaning up your act, but it's actually hard to sustain something that's based on fear or anger. I think what gets us to really sustain changes is figuring out what we love and acting on that thing's behalf. Like that's going to create like a deep sense of like passion and motivation to keep up with whatever those changes are. And I want to highlight three places where I feel like we have a love deficit in our culture. So the first one is that I think that white people need to learn to love brown people better than we do right now. And I say that because the countries that have contributed the most to this crisis are dominated by white people. The countries that are taking the brunt of the effects are predominantly brown people. And I believe that we have let ourselves get away with that in part because there's a dehumanization and a disconnect that happens. So if you can't look at those pictures, and I'm obviously speaking to the white people in the audience at the moment, if you can't look at those pictures coming out of Asia or Brazil or Africa and see your people in a very intimate way, in a very connected way, then that racism is going to let us check out from taking a lot of responsibility for stuff. And so I actually think that anti-racism work is some of the most important work that we can be doing right now if we really want to get a handle on having a planet that's going to be functional and it's going to work. So that's the first love deficit. The second one, and this is even harder to swallow in some ways, is that I don't think we're loving our kids well enough right now. I've done this talk with my mom in the room and my 18-year-old son in the room, both, and sort of take a deep breath both times because nobody wants to think that they don't love their kids well enough, right? But if we really thought about what we're doing and what world we're leaving for our kids, I don't think we'd be making the decisions that we're making right now. So I think, again, we're doing that checking out thing, even with our own children and our grandchildren and what legacy we're leaving and what planet we're leaving. So I think we're going to have to clean that one up. So then the third one is that I think we need to learn to love the planet better than we are right now. So a lot of us grew up in places where we didn't have a lot of direct contact with the natural world. And like, we don't even know what we're losing in a lot of cases. And so it's easy to go, eh, not such a big deal. But if you watch the news stories, like there was this horrible story that went around on Facebook, I don't know, three or four months ago now, of like 10,000 seals washing up dead on the shores. And you know, seals are, they're large mammals of the water that are sort of at the top of the food chain, and we're large mammals that are sort of at the top of the food chain on the land. Like, they're kind of equivalent to us in a lot of ways. And that's an indication that, like, the ocean systems are breaking down. And so we got to figure out how to love the oceans better than we're doing right now. And the forest, that's what gets me. I'm a forest kid is, you know, when I see forests that are not being as viable, that hits me really hard. So you got to learn how to love those forests better. And if nothing else, learn how to love the soil that takes all that natural world magic and turns it into food that feeds our bodies. So finding some aspect of the natural world that you can really become a champion for and, like, lean your love into that thing and say, I'm going to act because I don't want to lose this thing. 
because I want us to be in that harmony and in that kind of balance with that natural environment. And right now we're kind of blowing it. Okay, so we need to up our love if we're going to fix this thing. So here we are. We're sort of at this crossroads right now. You know, we can keep headed in this direction where we're burning the planet out gradually, or we can head back in another direction and actually still have a really vibrant planet. And what I want to say is, I don't actually care what decisions you've made in your life up to this point. Like, this isn't about judging people. But what it is about is making an invitation to choose again. Okay, so however your life has been set up, that's fine. But we've got this opportunity right now to actually make some different choices. And just about all of us have had an experience where, you know, at some point in our lives, our life has looked really different than it did two years ago or five years ago or ten years ago or whatever that timeline is for you, where you've acclimated to having a different life and having your circumstances be really different. And I think we're being pushed right now into a place where our lives are gonna look really different. And that may happen legislatively, it may happen economically, it could happen by choice. And it could happen on a timeline that's a lot more sane for us and that isn't gonna feel like being stuck in a squeeze box quite so much. And so that's my invitation is choose again. You know, choose to set your life up differently and in a way that is in that flow and in that harmony with the natural world because that's what I think we need to do right now. And if there is any way that Dancing Rabbit can be a support for that, I mean, we're an eco-village out in northeastern Missouri, but we're also a nonprofit, and part of our mission is supporting these kinds of changes happening. So we've got a bunch of opportunities. One is that we've got a low-carbon lifestyle webinar series coming up this fall that you can actually get a better sense of like how we're doing what we're doing and what things you could be emulating in your own life. Um, there's also a lot of videos online. You can also come to Dancing Rabbit and learn directly from what we're doing. There's educational work opportunities at DR. Um, there's also the opportunity to live. I mean, we have plenty of space left on our land for more people, so if you're inspired by this, I encourage you to consider coming and visiting and plugging in or looking at living in another intentional community. It doesn't have to be us. And then finally, if you really love what we're doing, but neither one of those first two things work for you, like please consider supporting our organization, Citizens Climate Lobby, other organizations, 350.org, because all, we're all nonprofits and even small donations go a long way. So you can learn, you can live, you can love us, and any of those will definitely help us all move to the world that we want. So that is it. Thank you so much for your attention for the last hour and 15 minutes. Holy crap. Okay. Thanks. So I have about 20 minutes before I'm going to need to start packing up to go hop on a train. So I'm happy to answer questions. We're about that much time. Yeah, go ahead. I took the question, how did you pick Dancing Rabbit as a name? And um, why Seattle? What, what is our solid waste? I'm from Seattle. What is our solid waste issue? Um, OK, so why, why the name Dancing Rabbit is the first question. Um, so, so this is actually a funny story. So this is an example of how consensus can go wrong sometimes. Um, so, they, so the founders were gearing up to do tabling at Earth Day in 1993. And somebody the day before said, you know, this, it's better to table if you actually have a name to call something rather than this vague, we're going to do something someday. And so they like stayed up half the night and you know, brainstormed. And you should never try to name something by consensus. It's just not a good idea in general. Um, but one of the founders was reading this book that had this, uh, this chapter in it where these rabbits were sort of frolicking in the moonlight. And so somebody I was just call it Dancing Rabbit. And it was like, fine, but we're changing it as soon as we get, you know, we get around to it. And then they, by the time we got around to having energy to change it, and it sort of caught on. And so, it's, and it's playful. I mean, the thing I like about it is that it's not, it doesn't scream, oh my god, we take ourselves horrifically seriously, because we really don't. Um, so yeah, so that's the story with the name. Um, and then what is Seattle's solid waste problem? I, you know, it's interesting actually, I've been told by somebody from Seattle that these numbers are now out of date because they've started doing um, um, citywide composting programs. And so I think that the numbers are actually lower than they were when we took the snapshot of both communities. Um, and I think a lot of it is just that a lot of people in Seattle have really fast paced city lives and so there's a lot of convenience foods. 
I mean, that's the best that I can tell is that it was not composting universally and lots of fast food, lots of takeout. Seems to be what's making Seattle's numbers higher than ours. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious about how you handle uh, things like ownership structures and group decision making and things like that at Dancing Rabbit. Mm -hmm. So is it like a land trust or how does the land own and <coughs> how do you handle sort of individual <coughs> Yeah, so our land is owned by a land trust, and um, individuals own their own homes and own the improvements on the land. So if you put a big garden in, you can sell that to other people, um, but you don't own the land underneath it, um, which I think is like, a, it's another one of those fundamental worldview kind of pieces of not doing private ownership of things. And so we're trying to sort of ride a line between Americans feeling safe enough to be willing to build a house and you know, and not buying fully into the privatization thing. Um, so we, up until two years ago, two and a half, I guess now, um, we made all our decisions with full group consensus. And we actually had started four years before that looking at how we could create a system that would sort of retain the cultural pieces and the spirit of consensus without having, like, as our group got bigger and bigger, having us all have to sit around in a circle and talk about things. Um, so we now have a hybrid system where we still do some decisions by full group consensus, and we have a village council that is chosen by a mostly consensus -y process, and they operate that consensus. So, so I talk about us in terms of being a consensus culture, but not a pure version of consensus anymore. And then we also have, so, so there's really, there's two parts to Dancing Rabbit's mission. There's create the, um, the sustainable demonstration project, and then there's go out there and change the world. And the village is responsible for building the demonstration project. And so that's, that's when I talk about Dancing Rabbit Eco Village and our numbers, that's what I'm talking about is the village side of things. And then there's a nonprofit organization that lives at Dancing Rabbit and that our job is the nonprofit, and so I'm the executive director of that. Um, our job is to go out there and make this relevant, make it known, you know, help inspire people to, you know, the idea that it's possible to do this kind of stuff. And that organization has a board of directors, and so that's what Chunky sits on our board of directors along with eight other people um, from around the country. And they operate that consensus as well. Yeah. Thanks for your work and your love and your work. You're welcome. Um, when I have thought about uh, living in the woods, um, as I turn it and I have, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that has kept me urban is that I think the world is quite urban. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of potential efficiencies to be had in an urban mm -hmm. life. I wonder if you could kind of comment on that. Mm -hmm. Do you see a low carbon urban lifestyle? Do you see that in conjunction? It just seems like not everyone mm -hmm. could live this life. Yeah, so she's asking about the, you know, most, most people in the world live in urban environments and that not everybody could do what Dancing Rabbit is doing, so just asking me to comment on the urban thing. So yes, absolutely. Um, and actually, a lot of this is easier to do in urban environments than it is. Like the transportation stuff, it's like way easier to do. I mean, the fact that you have the BART here is like, that's huge. We have no BART in rural Missouri. Um, so a lot of this stuff is very applicable in urban environments. You can collectivize, you can be doing shared meals, you can be getting local food, um, and that has more to do with your climate than it does whether you're urban or rural. Um, so if you've got good systems where food is coming into the city from those outlying areas, then it's actually a lot easier to do a lot of this stuff and to have, you know, especially in California, to have a pretty full, rich diet. Like, we still get our rice from California because you can't grow it in Missouri. And so, um, you know, and I realize California is taking a hit right now, and so I don't actually know if this is going to continue to be true, but at least this urban environment is actually really positive for doing this kind of thing. And there are many, many urban intentional communities, so it's not just a rural phenomenon at all. And I think it's essential that, you know, just like we're out there pioneering how you do it in rural environments, I think it's essential that there's other groups doing it in suburban environments and small towns and like hardcore urban environments. I think those are all really necessary. And we picked where we picked in part because we wanted to do really experimental building stuff and there's fewer uh, building codes and zoning stuff in rural areas. So that's why we ended up in a rural area. Um, but that experiment, like not everybody has to be experimenting. Like take what's learned in those experiments and then apply them <coughs> in different environments. Um, and there's actually a couple of us that are working on um, starting a new project that's going to be doing 
um, legal and policy reform work around sustainable community stuff. And other things, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's involved in this project. Um, and that project is partly motivated by wanting there to be more freedom for urban groups to be able to do the kind of experimental stuff that we're able to do at Dancing Rabbit because of the code and zoning things being so different. So, so there's a group that's starting to work on like how to make that easier for urban groups. But yeah, I'm, by all means, do this in an urban environment. I think it's really important. Yeah, so if I, I think I'm understanding your question right, let me make sure I'm getting it right, is that you're asking about the, the sort of how do we change the culture around vegetarianism and veganism being weird still? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, I mean, I think part of it is is just more and more people doing it. So the um, when I was growing up, something like 2% of the U.S. population were vegetarian, and just three years ago it was 13%. Like, it's actually gotten much more normal over the course of my lifetime. And I think those numbers are actually shifting faster now. Like just in the last 10 years, there's been a huge shift where you have like vegan restaurants. I mean, when I was growing up, like there was, that stuff didn't exist at all. Like I'm not even sure we knew what vegan food was when I was growing up. So I think that a lot of those shifts have happened. And you know, I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of how we change a lot of this worldview stuff is just having conversations, just engaging with people and talking them through it like this is why this is important to me and you know I have an equivalent one of these where I so I don't fly anymore and part of that is my health reasons um, but part of that is about the planet and so I so I figured out how to like come up with the catchy line that I can use with people and so what I sort of toss off when people ask me about it is you know the planet and I we both have some health issues you know and just to make it light and make it very matter-of-fact and like yeah this is why I'm doing this thing and I think sometimes when we go into those conversations, we almost apologize for being weird. Like we buy into the I'm weird thing. And then I think it's important to not do that and to just go like, you know, it's actually like a totally sane, perfectly normal thing to care about the state of the planet. And so I think us embodying that is gonna help those conversations go better and help things be normalized. And then it's just that courage thing. It's like, so somebody looks at you like you're a nut, great. You know, that's about them, it's not about you. And so, you know, just sort of, Stealing yourself and having that courage going into those social situations when you're doing something differently, and then not, sh and if you're on the other side of it, not shaming people. You know, when they not going like, oh come on, I just really want to go to the burger joint. It's like, well, you know, that's not that sensitive actually to you know to somebody's like deep held values around something. Yeah. Um, I wonder what your ideas around population Right, right. Um, so this is a question about like uh, population growth. So I think the the sticky thing about population growth is when um, is when it gets used in really racist ways, which is often what's happened in international policy. Is that um, you know some countries have asked other countries to deal with that, and it's mostly brown people that are being asked to have fewer children. I think that that is, like in my mind, the appropriate thing is for that to be happening within each individual country, and that that should be like internal country conversations that are happening. And um, I think, you know, and obviously if we had fewer people, that would be a better thing, you know, for the planet in general. And yet we don't necessarily have to have fewer people in order to bring our ecological footprints down. So. You know, and the U.S. has already um, reduced our overall birth rate, and so now I think we're on to needing to look at this part of it. Like, that's where our big challenge is. Um, but I think it's really tricky. I mean, I think, like, international policy around that stuff is really, really sticky stuff. Yeah. 
possibly related question um, that I've been trying to think of how to formulate. I wonder if we could think through this loving our children better. Mm -hmm. um, because um, as a mother, yeah. that hit me really powerfully. Um, and as a lifelong environmentalist. And every parent I know does their 100%, yeah. 150% yeah. best for their children. So I'm just wondering if, um, I don't know, if there's a way to reframe that part mm -hmm. of your message. Because I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the future. My daughter's going to be 35 in 2050. She's going to be at the prime of her life, and things are going to be falling apart. And that's not OK, right? Right, right. And you and I and everyone else, we're doing everything we can mm -hmm. to avoid the worst possibilities. So we know that. So it's not, I, for me, I, I'm not sure it's about loving, mm -hmm. not loving our children enough. Everyone I know loves mm -hmm. their children right. know, more than right. them. Well, and this is that part of like, like we don't want to think about it in those terms. And so part of my job is, is to do this dance between inspiring hope and pushing people. And so this is one of the places where I'm pushing. And I know a lot of people who don't think about environmental stuff at all. It is not part of the love formula with their kids. You know, I mean, they're, they think that being a good parent is like, you know, soccer games and every gadget that they can possibly get for their kids. And I'm challenging that. Like, I don't think it's about material comfort. Um, and, so it, you know, and I, and I can't say that I've done my best by my kids through my whole life either, you know. But I think, I think then distinguishing love from material comfort is super mm -hmm. important. Those are obviously totally different things. Mm -hmm. and, um, I know people in the Himalayas who love their kids you know, better than I do, and they, they live on $1,000 a year. Right. So it's clearly not about material stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I absolutely agree that in the US we need to de-link right. that. Um, and so I think right there, that's super helpful mm -hmm. yeah. to, to clarify what we mean or mm -hmm. what you mean when you say loving our kids better right I think that would be super helpful right and it's the same thing where like there's obviously you know people who have like like deeply intimate relationships across race you know and what I'm trying to do is get people to think about love in terms of like think about the ecological implications and put it through that lens and then see if there's stuff that could be different and how you're doing your life and not and most people have not done that work mm. you know and they're terrific parents like it's not about being it's not like being about a bad parent, it's about have you, like, have you really looked at this other piece mm -hmm. of what it is. And so I mean to be provocative mm -hmm. in there. You know, I mean to send you home and make you think uh -huh. about it. You know? And I hate it. You know, like I've had like, torturous conversations with my son mm -hmm. about this stuff. You know, where we've both been in tears and we've both been like, what do we do with this? You know, and how do I, how to, and torturous conversations with my mother about this, you know. So, so, yeah, I get it. I get it, and I also, I do mean to push mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. Okay, other? Um, I really appreciate your pushing, because I think the sort of loving your children, I mean, I found myself nodding. Because I think what happens, especially in the West, is it's like a one-to-one -one love. Mm. And instead of mm -hmm. thinking like you loving your child is your child who holds this like planetary existence. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the invisible piece that doesn't get addressed. Mm -hmm. And because of, as I'm watching your presentation, and as I watch many presentations who bring up climate change issues, I feel it very personally. And I feel, I get very anxious, I get very scared, and I, I'm at the age, you know, even I age myself, where I'm thinking about having children. Mm -hmm. And there are very serious things that I have to say yes to and I say no to. And so I think the point I'm trying to, well, the first point is I just appreciate your pushing, and the second point yes. is just addressing that generational gap mm -hmm. and who actually is feeling what you're saying. I'm not saying like the older generation isn't, but I think there's a difference. Yeah, I think I've had a lot of young people come up to me after this thing and go, thank you. Like, no, and I actually, I, I started doing a thing that I haven't picked back up. This is actually the first time I realized this would have been the first appropriate audience to do this with because I've mostly been talking to older adults on this tour, but like literally just going, I'm sorry. Like, wow, like my generation 
in my parents' generation, we knew, we knew, and we blew it. Yeah, and we're still blowing it. And I'm trying to get us to stop blowing it, but I am really sorry about the legacy that we're leaving you. You know, and I think that people don't hear that from people over 40. Like, they're not getting that message. They're not getting, like, that there's a remorse. And I think those of us who work on it, there is remorse in there. But young people sure aren't hearing it very much. You know, and the, the folks in Washington that are mostly my age and older are like, they're not doing a very good job of picking the ball up at this point. And that is a generational thing. And so my son's generation is, you know, like, like I hear a lot of them talk about, like, I'm not sure it matters what I major in for college, you know, or I have no idea what to major in because I don't know what the world is going to look like in five years. I mean, I literally have sat through that dinner conversation with my son and some of his friends where they're like, I don't fucking know. And it's like, and I want them to be able to say that, you know, and to start. So that's part of that pain that's in there when we start unpacking this and we start looking at the implications is that there is generational, you know, and I pray to God that it isn't turning into generational genocide. Because that's where I go when I get afraid about this stuff, is that that's basically what we've done. That's the really heavy end of this. And I think we got to look at that and then get through it <coughs> and then try to do something about it to not have that be where it ends up. But, you know, boy, I, if I hadn't had an ecologist for a father, I wouldn't have had to think about this at all. You know, and that is not true for people your age, for most of the people in this room. You don't get the option of not thinking about it. So given the urgency and the fact that we're on the, uh, for, we're preparing for Paris in December and the yeah. negotiations, what would, um, in your mind's eye, make Paris look like a success? I mean, I, I think that it would look like, I think it would look beyond what just about any country is talking about right now. Um, I mean, I think, you know, when they talk about like, oh, we're going to reduce our emissions by 25% by the year 2030, it's like, no, like that's not actually good enough. And I think that we have the tech, I mean, you look at Germany, Germany's already switched over to almost all renewables. There's, you know, multiple countries in South America that have switched over to almost all renewables at this point. So it's not about technology, it's about political and economic will at this point. And so I think it would look like probably something more like, like 80% by 2020, that would actually feel like we're finally taking that seriously. Um, and it would also look like passing something like, you know, the carbon fee and dividend thing. Like, I think if the U.S. did that before Paris, that would tell me that the U.S. is actually taking it seriously. And it's 80% of 1990 levels? Or were, do you know the um, baseline? I'm trying to think. Because the 10% number is based on, I think, 2010 consumption number, emission numbers. Um, but... Yeah. Hey, 80% of 1990, that would be even better. You know, I mean, I think a lot of it is like, are we willing to actually stand up to the fossil fuel companies? Like, that's actually a big part of it. Like, we can make our lifestyle changes, and I think we should, and I think we're going to have to, but actually it's a lot of it is just like the political world to like stand up to those companies, because that's where that stuff needs to stay in the ground, period, in order to do it. So I think like an international statement to that effect, that would be powerful. So would be things like that. Oh, that's my bell telling me that I need to switch gears into packing up. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here packing up, and you're welcome to follow me around and ask me more questions. That's totally fine. But unfortunately, I have to be on a train at 10 o'clock over at Emeryville. So thank you so much for attending. And also for being real about your response. I really actually appreciate you having you know, the chutzpah to go like, ah! I don't, you know, I'm having a reaction to that, and that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and also then you for speaking up and going like, hey, I actually kind of like that. So, <laughs> good. All right, thank you, everyone, and please be in touch. There's um, a mailing list sign up floating around somewhere. There's also my cards and a bunch of different um, paraphernalia over there. Paraphernalia, that's the wrong word. Propaganda. I don't know what the word is. Paper thingies with writing on it. Um, about Dancing Rabbit and about low carbon transitions and all that kind of stuff over on that little board. So, thank you. And a half.